So at Rackspace, we care about how to get you connected to the internet. And a, a lot of times when you're using an iPhone or, a, or an Android phone, uh, the connectivity ain't all that great with your cell phone network. And we're talking with a company that's trying to solve that by hooking together all these new Wi-Fi networks, like at Starbucks and stuff like that. And it's called DeviceScape, and it's really interesting. Who are you? I'm Dave Fraser. I'm the CEO of DeviceScape. I've been in the device business for uh, for a long time, it's, but I'm a I'm really a confirmed gadget freak. Um, I'm excited about devices that reach out and connect to new types of applications and services all the time, and I've really been enthusiastic about how you solve that problem of getting connected in the first place. Yeah, and it's a, a big issue. I, you know, I've talked to the CTO of AT and T. I interviewed him before the iPhone came out, and I said, are you really ready for these <laughs> iPhones to come out? <laughs> it's like, yeah, 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 no problem, we can deal with it. And of course, it, it, no, that didn't quite work, you know. Rocky and I were at the World Series down the street, and we couldn't get a, co co a connection at all. And you're trying to help solve that by stitching, well, tell me what you do. Well, uh, you're absolutely right. Network congestion has been a huge thing with the rise of the smartphone. You know, we're being marketed to that uh, everybody enjoys watching streaming video on their on their smartphones. While Andy, who actually lives in a city, particularly in um, in a, a, a San Francisco or New York or any large city, with a lot of smartphone users, and knows that that's a near impossible thing uh, to do. So. Uh, the network operators are experiencing an incredible amount of data congestion and we try and solve that problem by uh, allowing offload onto the Wi-Fi network. And how, how does that work? So you're aggregating all these uh, what uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, so there's one right behind you, right? <laughs> Spitting out Wi-Fi <laughs> so our iPhones work. But you're trying to aggregate all this stuff all these different Wi-Fi hotspots, but you're only doing it with businesses, right? Like Starbucks or McDonald's or uh, City Hall or public public uh, Wi-Fi, right? Yeah, you know, Wi-Fi is really everywhere. We're used to it in our homes and workplace, um, but it's it's really massively deployed in the public space already. You know, we think of today branded locations like McDonald's and Starbucks are the place you find Wi-Fi, but the reality is that Wi-Fi is in hotels, uh, cafes, uh, restaurants, it's in the train, it's on uh, BART, not far from, uh, from where we are. It's really everywhere. And if you can find a way to actually uh, assemble it, to aggregate it into uh, what feels like a single virtual network, you get the benefit of um, this incredible asset uh, being all the places uh, where people are. And to your last point, yeah, we try and uh, amalgamate the Wi-Fi that's intentionally designed for people to use, for it to be shared. There are, of course, people sharing um, their their home network, but we try and find the ones in, in businesses and public spaces that are intentionally uh, put up for sharing. Yeah, and so if I'm walking around San Francisco, what does your network look like to me? Does it just say AT&T Wi-Fi, or and it asks me to join the AT&T Wi-Fi network, or does it say something else? Well, uh, our product is actually three different parts. There is a there's an application or a client that fits in the device, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet or, or a PC. There's the service itself, which is a cloud-based service, and then we have this virtual network. Um, because the software is in the handset, the user actually doesn't really know or care whether they're on Wi-Fi or not. The intention is that we'll get them uh, a high-quality connection where, wherever there is one of these qualified Wi-Fi locations, but we basically have a philosophy that people don't really care how they're connected. You know, they're, they've got a, a data service on their device, they pay good money for that data service and they expect it to work. Whether that service is coming over 3G or 4G or a local Wi-Fi connection shouldn't matter so much to many of the users. First of all, what carriers are you guys on or are supporting? So uh, we, we have several um, carrier relations. Uh, there are not many that we can actually talk about. One of the ones that are first and uh, 
uh, most uh, publicly visible it was Metro PCS here. That was we've been uh, designed into all of their Android handsets since day one, since they first la launched uh, launched Android. And the whole idea is that it's in the device. The user doesn't really care about it. The user doesn't have to pay anything for it. They're already paying for a data service. And so uh, the impact it has is it improves the customer experience, but it also substantially reduces the amount of traffic that the, the operator has to carry over their cellular network. Yep. So it's a, it's a benefit so for they both save, parties. They save a lot of money because they're probably having to pay for the towers and, and all that. And That's if right. they go through the Wi-Fi network, it's a lot cheaper. Um, can a consumer make sure that, that they have access to your network without knowing what service they're on? In other words, can I uh, make a deal with you to put it on my iPhone? Or? Uh, Even well, if you're not on my carrier, <laughs> well, you personally could definitely make a deal with us too. <laughs> to do it. But um, uh, yes and no, uh, it's okay. a complicated answer. When when we were first building out our, our network, uh, it's entirely crowdsourced, so we needed to get some crowds out there in our, uh, to get the um, get the network built. So we released a consumer application on the Android Marketplace and the uh, the iPhone App Store and uh, people used our application, they downloaded and used our application typically because they were business traveler or they had a network that they used every day uh, that they were really sick and tired of logging into manually. Because yeah. there's lots of networks out there that you not only have to teach your device once to talk to it, but then you have to fire up Safari or the mobile browser, or whatever it is, and log in on the page. Yep. It happens to you know university students on their campus-wide networks every day. So we built um, a community of users uh, that used our client for that, and ultimately that allowed us to crowdsource a pretty large network. Now that we have um, mobile operators, uh, you know, basically designing handsets with our with our software built in. Users don't need to download an application. It's it's just there, and quite often it's running in the background without them knowing or caring. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, I'd love to make sure that I ha actually have access to your Wi-Fi network because it sounds pretty useful in a place like San Francisco or New York where I'm I am a lot. It's it's true. Um, so we we are about to. Um, uh, republish our uh, an improved version of our consumer application for uh, for Android on our website at devicescape.com you can download uh, Macintosh and PC and a variety of other handset versions unfortunately the only handset that we can't run on right now is the or do a good job of running on right now is the iPhone yeah because some of the Restrictions that Apple places on iOS. Yeah, Apple doesn't let you guys talk to the to the Wi-Fi wi uh, modem. Basically, that's correct. It doesn't Android, allow us. Android does. Right? Android allows us to do just about anything, which is which is great. But uh, we run well on all the other mobile platforms. iOS we're restricted because we can't run in the background, so we can't do all that smart stuff for the user. And also, for some reason, they don't allow you to manipulate the preferred network list, so we can't say these are the good networks to, to connect to. We can't do that in real time. It's a bit it's of a tough. It's way, w when, when they make deals with carriers, this is what's <laughs> going on behind the scenes. You know, I don't think we want to let guys like you come in here and take out <laughs> our network, right? It's true, but now the network operators are starting to um, really adopt Wi-Fi as an offload strategy, as a mainstream yeah. strategy. It wasn't that long ago that uh, the mobile operators were disabling Wi-Fi on handsets. Just a couple of years ago, you couldn't buy a whole bunch of Verizon handsets with, with Wi-Fi actually enabled. But now they've uh, just about any, every mobile operator in the world has a Wi-Fi offload strategy. And we hope to be able to convince them one by one that a virtual Wi-Fi offload strategy can be even better. Yeah. If I walk around with uh, an iPhone, do I see your network as a locked network? Do I see a like a device scape network, or do I, or do you just uh, show yourself as like what Metro PCS or something like that? So there's no physical device scape network at all. The device scape network is completely uh, virtual. 
we call it a curated virtual network. Curated because we're really trying to pay attention to knowing everything about it and its quality. So you'll never actually see anything called the device gate network. It's a completely virtual concept because underneath the surface and what you'll see on your devices network list is you know, uh, Starbucks or you'll see Bob's Hamburgers or you'll see you know, the Paradise Hotel or you'll see BART Wi-Fi, right? Yeah. Those types of things. That's the physical underlying set of assets that are completely chaotic, but on top of it, there's a completely virtual level. You can experience it, but you can't see it named. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I can't hack into it. Not <laughs> <laughs> <That's> so easily. <laughs> How do you guys make money? So you resell this virtual network to a carrier like Metro PCS. That's is that your main business model here? Yeah, we've actually got uh, two types of customer. The main one are the are the mobile operators or the MVNOs that are uh, struggling to provide high quality service. You know, it's so expensive for them to put up uh, new cell towers, particularly in a an area which is already congested. Yep. Um, it's incredibly expensive to buy spectrum, even if you can get spectrum. So, you know, they're using us as a way to offload significant quantities of data. They uh, they can push out buying new equipment or uh, spectrum. They can lower their operational cost, and they can do great things regarding pricing. You know, they can stay unlimited, or they can offer low cost tethering plans. We have another um, mission, I would say, if not a business. But uh, we'd like to enable um, many types of Wi-Fi only devices, um, of which there is an explosion of innovation, everything from you know Wi-Fi pens to cameras to media players. We'd like to basically give uh, the users of those um, a free massive network out of the box ah. so that they don't have to wrestle with the complexities of and that's the internet of things that people keep talking about. That yeah. that even our lights eventually will have a IP address so you can sit here and control them from a, yeah. a cell phone of some kind. Yeah, we basically feel that you should be able to ship a device to a user where they switch it on and it gets connected automatically and people don't have to spend you know, $20, $50 a month for a cellular connection, you know, use the Wi-Fi that's there. But the, the mobile operator business is our primary business because it's really a big value proposition and it's a critical problem today. Uh, the sort of Internet of Things thing, we strongly believe it's going to be billions of devices, but that's that's an emerging market for us right now. Y you make sure that each of these Wi-Fi hotspots has uh, a decent amount of connectivity. D I guess you have a minimum bar that you you want to make sure that inbound and outbound it can handle a certain amount, and and that the what the access point is up most of the time. Yeah, we try and uh, w we try and score the quality of each individual location, so we're measuring it all the time. Wi-Fi is also something that is quite dynamic, so something that worked one day might not work the other because the, you know, the barista unplugs the, the cable from the back of the access point or, or, or whatever. There could be a situation where lots of people are on the network, so at any one point in time a new user might not be accommodated. So we try and ensure really a high quality of service, and our customer uh, selects the threshold that they want depending on what they what they care about. You know, uh, somebody, a customer who really cared about um, only supporting sort of voice or maybe internet browsing might go with a lower quality of service where, whereas somebody that had really was trying to, um, video was a, was a very important thing to them would require a higher quality of service. So we, we allow a sort of selectable quality of service from this you know, virtual asset. Do you have any competitors? I, I know Fawn is out there with a, not really a direct competitor, they, they w want you to buy an actual piece of hardware mm -hmm. that you put in your house or put in your business and it joins together a, a community. You, you're not doing that, right? No. You don't own any hardware. We don't own any hardware. We love Fawn, so we don't think of them as competitive, but they're definitely trying to assemble a community and a big access network where it's free to the Fineros, as they're called. But uh, we think that we our primary competition is actually um, the, the network operator themselves, and they're unintentionally competitive with us. They've been used to building out uh, big cellular networks, and now they're all thinking about how they build out uh, Wi-Fi networks as well. 
our, uh, it's unintentional competition because what we're really doing is we're making a, a virtual network out of the Wi-Fi that's already there, yeah. the stuff that's already deployed, and it really dwarfs the, um, the carrier's own networks. They're, it's just a much, much larger asset than what a carrier could build out. Yeah. Build out. You guys are only in the United States right now? We're mainly uh, the United States, but we've just recently started uh, expanding our virtual network um, internationally. We really wanted to concentrate and get critical mass here, bring on a set of uh, carriers, and then sort of take it international. So we just started building out the network. And you guys focus mostly on urban cities like San Francisco, New York, that kind of thing, or do you get into the Backlands of Nevada, for instance. It's everywhere. It's basically where where, where anybody, where people go. In the beginning, uh, it was all about how um, where the people that had downloaded our consumer app were. So it tended to be concentrated in uh, around uh, airports and metropolitan areas with lots of business professionals, traveling professionals, and also university towns. But these days, since it's in handsets by default. It's everywhere, it's wherever the subscribers are. So we've poked into every nook and cranny of, uh, of the US right now. It's a huge network in, in the US. Wow. Um, where do we, uh, well, um, how old are you guys and, and how are you funded? Because it's um, an interesting business. <laughs> it's not the same as I usually uh, you know, talk with a, an internet startup trying to do an Instagram or something like that? Sure, it's, it's an unusual company for sure. Uh, we've been going since uh, 2005. Uh, we're banked by Kleiner Perkins uh, and August Capital, although we've been profitable for uh, going on a couple of years now and really really starting to, to expand our business. So we're, uh, I'd say we're a late stage startup, just really beginning to, uh, to grow rapidly as uh, more and more handsets and tablets come out with our software included. Very cool. Well, thanks for coming out. Where do I learn more about you guys? At devicecape.com, or you can always call me. <laughs> you want to put your phone number out there? I, I do that. <laughs> well, maybe I'll answer that question again then. Yeah. You're uh, on Twitter and Facebook? Yeah, we're on Twitter. You can follow us at, at devicecape. Uh, we have a Facebook page, of course, and devicecape.com. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Robert.